Years ago, I found myself in a difficult situation. I was so depressed and I felt so down that I actually wanted to take my life. At that stage, I believed that God hated me. I believed that God was angry at me and I just didn't want to live anymore. I thought that the problems of life would just get worse and worse. When I was a young boy, I thought that I would have great uh, visions, great dreams, great future. I had this expectation. But soon after going through life for a period of time, I found myself hopeless, feeling down, feeling depressed. And as you can see on my side here, I've got a scale where the problem and the promise is on. And every time there's a problem in our lives, we have a promise to counter that. But we always have to decide whose report, whose report are we going to believe? Now, I must be honest, back then I didn't know God. I didn't know the word. I didn't know anything about God. So I respected leaders, church leaders, those that were in church. And I expected that they would tell me the truth about God. But as a matter of fact, religion does not know God. Religion is still trying to find God because religion is what you can do for God. But relationship is what God has done for you. And this is what it's about my message today, whose report. I was surprised to see that during the coronavirus pandemic, so many Christian leaders, so many church leaders had conflicting reports. So many of them saying that this was from God, saying that this was God's judgment and all sorts of things that people were saying. And I was just thinking to myself, what are people experiencing when they hear this? When their child dies and they believe it's God that took the child. When there's a bad accident and people are severely injured and they believe it's God. When there's a natural disaster and a flood comes or there's lightning that comes and they believe that it's God. Every time the negative things, the things that I believe the enemy brings into our lives, the, the effects of the curse, every time God is blamed and we are believing a lot of times the enemies report. We are a lot of times believing what the devil is saying and accepting things that we are not supposed to accept in our lives. I want to take you to a portion of scripture today as we go into this session. And I just want you to open your heart. I want you to open your heart and receive. I know it's difficult sometimes to hear what I'm saying. If you come from a strict religious background, if you believe that God is the author of, of hurt and hate and, and death, it's difficult for you to have this shift in your mentality. But let's just go back to a position or a, or a period in time where Israel was actually on the edge of the promised land. The nation of Israel found themselves on the edge of the promised land. The land, the geographical area promised to Abram, Isaac and Jacob after hundreds of years Israel was traveling towards this land, not just physically, but spiritually. And here they were, were at the edge of the promised land. So the Lord said to Moses, he said, send some men to explore the land of Canaan, which I'm giving to the Israelites. So I'm giving it. There's no question about this. Then he says, from each ancestral tribe, send one of its leaders. Now, please take note as we're sharing this today that these were leaders. The Lord wanted the leaders to see the land. The Lord knew that the leaders had heard these promises for generations. Their uncles, their grandfathers, everybody knew about the covenant that God made with Abram and the land that God promised to Abram. Everybody knew that this was confirmed in, in Isaac's life, in Jacob's life, in every pilgrim's life it was confirmed over and over and over again and here they were a, a massive nation they have they had seen uh, God lead them out of Egypt with mighty plagues with a mighty hand they had seen the sea open in front of them they had seen bread fall from the sky and God provide for them they had seen water gushed out from a rock they had seen meat fall from the sky they had seen a pillar cloud and a, and, and, and a cloud and a fire cloud. They've, they'd seen all these things, the fire, the pillar, 
everything they saw, they heard God speak, they, they had experienced the supernatural. Like many of us had experienced the supernatural. Like many of us have seen these things in our lives. And yet they were at the promised land. They sent out leaders to, to spy out the land or to explore the land. And these leaders came back. And this is the account they gave to Moses. We went into the land which you had sent us. And it does flow with milk and honey. So it says, yes, the Lord did lead us to a place as he promised Isaac as he promised Abram, as he promised Jacob. And this land does flow with milk and honey. And here is its fruit. So they actually, if you read the other section, they actually had this huge fruit in there. They had this huge fruit showing them that one man had to carry this big portion of grapes between them. So here was physical proof. But, and that's the problem a lot of times in our Christian lives. When it comes to the promises of God, when it comes to receiving from God, sometimes we throw a but in there that's not supposed to be there. But the people who live there are powerful. The cities are fortified and they're very large. When we saw, uh, uh, we even saw the descendants of Anak there. So what they said is we saw giants there. We saw giants there. So you've got God on the one side and the giant on the other side as, as I've got here illustrated on the screen you've got God on the one side you've got the giant on the other side you've got the problem on the one side you've got the promise on the other side and here these leaders come back even though they've had this history they've had this great heritage they've had this promise for so many years they are faced with the physical problems that they're looking at In Numbers 13, 30, 31, we read, Then Caleb silenced the people before Moses and said, We should go up and take possession of the land, for we can certainly do it. But the men who, are, uh, who, but the men who had gone up with him said, We can't attack those people. They are stronger than we are. Now today, even as you listen to this message and you, you watch it or listen to it, you might say, they are stronger. My problem is stronger. The situation that I'm facing, the promise is bigger than the, the, the problem is bigger than the promise. I'm looking at this problem and it's overwhelming today. And this is what these people said. So I must say, we criticize these 10 spies, but we do the same. We do the same thing as far as God's promise is concerned. There's a lot of times in our lives where we, where we do the same. So they went further and they spread among the Israelites bad report. Bad report about the land they had explored. They said the land we explored devours those living in it. And the people we saw are of great size. Now they go plain with us. We saw the Nephilim there, the descendants of Anak. We seemed like grasshoppers in our eyes. And we looked the same to them. You see, when we look at our giants, when we face our giants, when, we, when we're standing in front of our giants, the giant might look much bigger than we are. But the fact is, our faith and our trust and our reliance is not in our size. It's not about how big we are. It's about how great and how awesome our God is. Whose report will you believe when you standing at the edge of the promised land and you are facing giants. You are facing fortified cities. You are, are facing a vast land with, with sophisticated defense systems. You are facing cancer. You are facing other dreaded disease. You are facing financial problems. You are facing marriage problems. You are facing depression. Whose report will you believe? What will you believe? Yeah, it's, it's strange that these men that saw themselves like grasshoppers, they, that, all that night they, they wept aloud and they grumbled against Moses and Aaron. If only we had died in Egypt, they said. They became negative. They, they resented the fact that even God led them out of Egypt. These 10 men were 10 out of 12 leaders and they had a negative report. They had such a negative report that they ended up wishing they were back in bondage, wishing they were back in slavery. 
because the problem that they were facing was so overwhelming. The giant that they were looking at, they were looking at these giants, they were looking at these fortified cities, they were looking and they were overwhelmed with what they saw with their eyes and they forgot. They forgot God. They forgot a God that opened a sea. They've, and we think to ourselves, these people were silly. They saw it. And how can they, how can they come here and, and doubt in God? And, and uh, how can the problem overwhelm them? But we do the same because throughout our entire lives, we see the hand of God. And if we don't see it, we're blind. But we see the hand of God. We see His provision. We see what He does for us. And yet we get to that point where we get to the problem. At the edge of the promised land, we get to that problem and, and we can't find that good report. We can't believe that good report. The report that, that Caleb and Joshua gave was not strong enough. These, these men ended up weeping. They ended up weeping aloud at night. They ended up grumbling. And it's, uh, they said to each other, choose a leader and go back to Egypt. So the Lord is silent at this stage. The Lord is silent at this stage. And, and, and these people are saying, let's choose a leader and let's go back to Egypt. Let's get out of here. Then Moses and Aaron fell face down in front of the whole assembly of Israel. Uh, and Joshua and Nun, the sons of Caleb, who were amongst those who explored the land, also tore their clothes. So these Joshua, Caleb and and, and Moses and, and Aaron, they fell face down and tore their clothes and they were humbling themselves because they knew that the assembly was getting into, into problems. Two out of 12 leaders had a confident report based on God's promise. How did Joshua and Caleb have a confident report? They based this on God's promise, not on the problem. Because God's promise is, is backed by God. And even though the problem is that we face is much, much bigger than we are. We, we're not worried about that because we're not basing our confidence on ourselves. We're not basing our confidence on what we can do and how we can do it. No, we're basing our confidence on God's promise because God backs His promises. Now, here the, the, the two is still trying to persuade the people. And, and they said to the entire assembly, The land we passed through and explored is exceedingly good. If the Lord is pleased with us, He will lead us into this land flowing with milk and honey. He will lead us into this land and will give it to us. Only do not rebel against the Lord. You see, when, when we don't believe God's promise, when we don't believe what God says, we are in rebellion. We are in rebellion against the order, the divine order. God has blessed us and we reject that blessing. And do not be afraid of the people of the land because we will swallow them up. Their protection is gone. These two men, they already saw the solution. They already saw the solution. They, they saw that these, these people, this strong fortified nations of, of Canaan, their protection was already gone because nothing can stand against God. But the Lord is with us. Do not be afraid of them. But the whole assembly talked about stoning them. So, yet gets next level. You know, a lot of times when, when, you, when you talk the truth, it really makes people angry. And even you watching this or listening to this, you might feel now a bit angered by the fact that I'm saying you can be victorious, that I'm saying you can be healed, that I'm saying you, you, you can overcome the evil in your life. Maybe for you, it's easier to believe that God caused this and that there's some lesson in this. That might be the easiest thing for you to believe because maybe you find some peace in that. But it's not about finding a, a false peace on earth. It's about finding God's promise and persisting in God's promise. And yeah, they escalate because they, they were talking about going back. They were talking about how good it was in Egypt. They were talking about that. But now they actually want to turn upon the, the two spies that came back, the two out of 12 that came back, the two leaders that said, no, don't believe the other 10. Don't believe what they're saying. Don't believe the lies. Don't believe the negative. Don't believe the bad report. Believe the, the good report. Believe what we are telling you. And 
as this was escalating, it got so bad that they wanted to stone them. And, and they probably would have killed these innocent men who were just standing on God's promise, like they killed Stephen when he told them the truth. Even his face was shining like an angel, the Bible says in Acts. And as he was preaching to them and telling them the truth, they got so angry, they sneered upon their teeth with anger and they killed him because it was easier for them to believe the lie than to believe the promise. Because the promise requires that you place your trust in God. The promise requires that you stand in faith. The promise requires that you speak to those mountains in your life. The promise requires that you and I take ownership of the problems and step into authority. And th this was too much for these people to handle. They thought, you know what, let's stone these guys and go back. But then the glory of the Lord appeared and, and the Lord spoke to them. That's as far as I want to go with this story. And I want to ask you, as I'm going to be asking you throughout this short message today, whose report are you going to believe? You might even have negative leaders in your life. You might have people, you might have sat under leaders that have told you that God caused certain things and you need to investigate the scripture for yourself so that you can make a decision what you are going to believe. Do not believe the lies of the devil. Do not end up one day dying only to find out that you were not even supposed to die. You were supposed to live and accomplish great things for God. But the enemy came to steal, kill and destroy your life. Don't be deceived. Your daughter is dead. This is my next point I want to make. And it says here in Mark 5.22. Then one of the synagogue rulers named Jairus came there, seeing Jesus. He fell at his feet and he pleaded earnestly with him. Here is a synagogue leader and we know that these people, uh, they did not like Jesus. We know that these people resisted Jesus. We know that these people were not Jesus' friend, but this man, this synagogue leader, must have been extremely desperate. He must have seen what Jesus did. He must have heard about the miraculous signs, miracles and wonders that was taking place. And he got into a desperate situation. Even though Jesus was probably sort of his enemy, he got to a point where, where, he, where he was so desperate. Have you ever been that desperate that you've gone to solve a, a solution that you would not normally have looked at? But this man probably tried everything else and he got to the point where he was 100% persuaded that if there was no divine intervention, if there was no supernatural occurrence, his daughter, his, his daughter, we don't know if it was his only daughter, but it could have been his only daughter would have died. And just imagine your child being at the throes of death. So he earnestly pleaded. This great synagogue leader came and he fell at his feet. He, he, he humbled himself. He said, Lord, he pleaded earnestly with him. My little daughter is dying. I'm sure she's dying. Please come and put your hands on her so that she will be healed and live. So this man had an expectation, a positive expectation, based on faith that he had, probably because of what he, he had heard about Jesus or seen about Jesus. And he had the expectation, he already had the outcome. He said, she will be healed and live. This was what he expected. He expected that. So Jesus went with him. So everything at this stage looks very positive because Jesus is, is going with this man. Uh, this man had probably obviously heard of Jesus or he knew about what Jesus did. And he was fully persuaded because he, you can see what he said there. He said, she will be healed and live. So he knew this. But we know that the woman with the issue of blood came in between touching Jesus as they walked and he said, power went out from me and, and uh, nobody said anything. And eventually the woman came forward and said, it was me. And then he said, woman, your faith has healed you. And as he was still speaking and Jairus was still standing next to him, some men came from the house of Jairus, the synagogue ruler. And they gave him the worst report that any father could get. Your daughter is dead. 
your daughter is dead. Why bother the teacher anymore? What would you have done or what, what are you going to do when in the wake of the promise, in the wake of en route to the promise and to fulfillment, all of a sudden you have a tremendous problem. You have something that comes up and that you have to face. With the promise, you will always find a problem. Yeah, Jairus was, he found Jesus. He, he knew Jesus was a solution to his problem. And, you know, he thought everything was going well. He was on his way. And then all of a sudden, a bad report came to him. What do you do when you are busy accessing the promise? When you are busy stepping into what you're supposed to step into? And then all of a sudden, you get a bad report. I can tell you what most, most people do. They turn around. They listen to that report. They turn around and they say, okay, I'm not going to bother the teacher anymore. Okay, maybe it wasn't God's will. Uh, maybe I missed it. Maybe I should have prayed more. Maybe, I, I, maybe it's because I, I've got sin in my life. Maybe it's because I didn't do this or I didn't do that. We start reasoning. But yeah, Jesus actually gives him instruction. Jesus says to him in verse 36, Ignoring what they said, Jesus told the synagogue ruler, Don't be afraid, just believe. Don't be afraid, just believe. Jesus ignored the bad report. And he obviously expected the synagogue ruler to also ignore the report. So how are we going to respond? Here we've got Israel on the edge of the promised land. We've got the leaders coming back and giving negative reports. So we need to sort out, sort out our theology that we know what we are believing. Number one, we need to sort it out. But here we've got another scenario where, you know, this guy's on the way to the promise. And all of a sudden he gets the reality that physically it's impossible for him to receive the promise. Something's gone wrong and it's destroyed. Uh, you know, like they say in English, the fat lady sang, it's over Scanova. And what, what, what is the instruction we receive here? Ignore what they said, Jesus told the synagogue leader. Don't be afraid, just believe. Ignore what they said. Ignore what they say. Ignore the negative report. I'm not saying be ignorant. I'm not saying be uh, stupid about it. I'm not trying to say that people need to be silly and act silly. No, 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 I'm not saying that. I'm just saying ignore what they said. Ignore it and still continue on the road. Still do what you're doing. Still persist. You know, when my business went down and a company that owed us a lot of money went bankrupt, I was physically, financially bankrupt on paper. But I knew that my God was greater than the problem. God, the promise that God gave me was greater than the problem. So on that scale I showed you when we started, the problem was there, yes, but the promise was greater. So I ignored it and I just continued to work as if the problem did not exist. Most people at that stage would run for the hills. They would stop fighting. They would give up. And that is unfortunately where the devil wins most of the ground. It's when that initial shock comes. It's when that initial disappointment comes. It's when that initial bad report comes a lot of times that we shrink back. And what is the thing that first comes in? Well, the first thing that comes in is fear. Don't be afraid because fear is the opposite of faith. Faith is an unwavering confidence in God's promises. And faith believes that what God said will happen it will be fulfilled but fear is the opposite so fear makes us retreat fear makes us running back so what does he say the third thing he says only believe so faith combats fear faith combats fear fill yourself with god's word fill yourself with god's promise ignore those negative reports whose report are you going to believe let me tell you something today if you don't learn to do this you will not be able to access anything in the kingdom because the kingdom of God is forcefully advancing and the forceful have to take hold of it. We have to possess the land. The land is not delivered to us. We have to possess it. 
We have to take it. This is what the leaders won't always tell you because 10 of the leaders will tell you you can't possess the land. They will tell you it's impossible. They will tell you it's a scientific impossibility. They will tell you that, no, this is unfortunately something that, you know, you can't do or that God doesn't want to do or whatever. But you will find that it's those leaders that will tell you those things. And unfortunately, I love them. And unfortunately, I care for them. But unfortunately, they are allowing God's people to miss the best that God has for them. They are misinforming God's church to the point where the enemy can come in like a flood and kill, steal and destroy people's lives because of a lack of knowledge, because they don't know the God of the miraculous. They don't know the God. They, religion is still trying to find God, still trying to appease God. But this God is today satisfied by the blood of Jesus Christ. This God is totally satisfied. Religion is unsure about this. Religion is still worried about it. And these leaders that are in religious positions, they are concerned about their own uh, salvation. I, one of the greatest leaders of one of the greatest churches in the world that has over a billion members, when he died, he was unsure if he was going to enter into heaven. He did not even have assurance of salvation because religion is never satisfied. Religion has to do this, do this, do that. But there's a satisfaction in relationship because we know who we are in Christ and we can fully uh, function in those areas as we do that. I want to end off with the arm of the Lord. And we ask ourselves, what is the arm of the Lord and why am I bringing this into the message today? Because the arm of the Lord is Christ and the finished work of the cross. Who has believed our report and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? You need a revelation of the arm of the Lord today to be able to stand and not just stand, but to thrive, not just to survive, but to thrive. You need a revelation of the arm of the Lord. This is what these teachings do. And I know a lot of people don't like to listen to teachings and people get bored and they get upset and it's too long. They just want 10 minutes or five minutes of motivation. But this kind of Bible teaching is what's going to take you from baby to maturity. This kind of Bible teaching is what's going to make you a giant slayer. Those who can stand and who can ignore the bad reports. This kind of teaching is what you need. You might not like it, but you need it. It's like your vegetables. You have to eat it. You have to get those nutrients. You have to eat those fruits. It's not what you like, but it's what you need. And sometimes we must get what we need. So the arm of the Lord. Let's look at this revelation of the arm of the Lord. Because it says here, are you going to believe this report? Are you going to accept this report? This is the report that you have to receive. This is the report for the New Testament church. This is the report for the church era that we are living in. This is the report that you and I have to believe. This is the report that you and I have to accept. And that is the report of the arm of the Lord. Now, what does it say? It says, surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. So you don't have to have grief. You don't have to have sorrow. Even if you're not perfect. Even if, if you're not the perfect Christian that you're supposed to be. This scripture says, you want to see what the arm of the Lord is? You want to see what the arm of the Lord is? You want to receive the revelation or the report of the arm of the Lord? And receive this report rather than all the religious, the ten religious leaders saying all the negative things? Do you want to be a Joshua and a Caleb that understands the arm of the Lord? Then you have to understand that He has bore our griefs and carried our sorrows. You also have to understand that He was wounded for our transgressions. In other words, God is not punishing people today. God does not want to punish you every time you do um, something wrong. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon Him. So it says... He's already paid the price for our peace that transcends the understanding. We can just step into peace because He is the Prince of Peace. And when we're in Christ, we have that peace. So the chastisement and the stuff that people have to go through, the bruising, uh, you know, it's not ours. It was Christ on the cross. And by His stripes, we, and, and Peter says, were healed. By His stripes, we were healed. So by His stripes, you were healed. 
Now, if you look at this healing, uh, this encompasses everything. Spirit, soul, and body. So if you're suffering from everything, you were healed. And you might say, oh, but what, for, what about my transgressions? Uh, what about my iniquities? Well, he was wounded. He was bruised. So you don't have to be. It says here, and the Lord has laid on him, the arm of the Lord, the iniquity of us all. So we don't have to worry about sin. And a lot of people, I'm not giving license to sin, but a lot of people, and especially religious people, have an extremely weak revelation of grace. Grace is what God had, has done for us. It, it is the unmerited favor. It, it is the price that Christ already paid on the cross. And if you can receive grace, then the, 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 the Spirit of God can start working uh, the fruit of the Spirit in your life. But it, it comes through the door of grace, which means you have to receive God's love. You have to receive God's acceptance. You have to receive God's salvation and not live in condemnation, but come to the throne with boldness so that you can step into who you are in Christ. You see, there's a problem with people that lose confidence because they are stuck in their own iniquity. They are still thinking about their own sin. And he bore the sins of many and made intercession for the transgressors. So he bore that sin and we do not need to look at that sin anymore. Yeah, the Lord says, Jesus declares in Luke 4, he says, The Spirit of the Lord, Luke 4, 18, The Spirit of the Lord is on me because He has anointed me to preach the good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to release the oppressed and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Now, religion won't tell you this, but this is the year of the Lord's favor. It might not look like it because the curse is working in the world and what you are seeing is the adverse effects of the curse and the, and the increase of iniquity amongst the Gentiles and the sinners is increasing, which is causing an imbalance in the world. And you're seeing all the disasters. You're seeing all the problems happen. But, you know, we are in the year of the Lord's favor because we are in this world, but we're not from this world. So we are living in the year of the Lord's favor. And we must understand this to access it. And we must understand what Jesus is saying here as far as his mission is concerned. He says, he has anointed me to preach the good news. He's, he's come to give you good news. Not bad news. Not about judgment. Not about hell. Yes, there is a hell. Yes, there is a judgment. But when you receive Jesus, when you receive the gospel of Christ, it is good news for you. It is good news. It's, a, it's news of acceptance. It's news of victory. It's news of comfort. And it's news of freedom. And it's news of recovery of sight. And it's, it's, it's news of release of oppression. And it's news of the proclamation of favor, that favor is upon us. It's a, the same is declared in John 10.10. 10. Similar, it says the thief comes only to steal, kill and destroy. This thief here is the enemy. He comes to steal, kill and destroy. But I have come that they might have life and have it to the full or have it abundantly. The word used here in the Greek is perissos. It's super abundant, overflowing life. That God has for his children. Whose report are you going to believe? Are you going to believe the ten that say yeah, God is angry. God is out to get you. You cannot possess the land. There's giants there. The cities are fortified. The land devours people. The economy devours people. Illness devours people. Are you going to believe that report? Or are you going to believe God's report? Are you going to believe what Jesus is saying here? Jesus is saying this exactly. He's saying the thief is coming to steal, kill and destroy. He says what you're seeing is stealing, killing and destroying. But we have the wisdom of God. We have the spirit of God. We have the power of God. We have the anointing of God. We have the authority of God that we can step into abundant life. Now I want to ask you, who is the arm of the Lord today? Because we know Jesus left. We know Jesus went to be with the Father. We know Jesus said he will not leave us as orphans. But he will send his spirit. We know that we have the great commission in Mark 16 and Matthew 28. Where he says to us, we must go and preach the gospel. We must lay our hands on the sick and they will recover. We must drive out devils. Uh, he says, even if, 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 if we handle serpents, which was a dangerous creature of the time, it will not hurt us. Even if, if we drink poison, which was a dangerous uh, a murder element of the time, 
it will not hurt us. So he says, none of the elements that you know that are dangerous will hurt you because of the authority. So who is the arm of the Lord? What is the arm? What does the arm mean? The arm stands for strength. The arm stands for power. The arm stands for execution. You can't do anything without your arm. And your arm does the work. Who is the arm of the Lord today? I want to suggest to you that the arm of the Lord is the church. The ecclesia, the called out ones. This is the arm of the Lord. This is the arm of the Lord today. I want to suggest to you that it's the, the church of Jesus Christ that has to believe the Isaiah 53 report of the Lord, of the arm of the Lord. We have to believe the report of the Lord. We have to look at the situations in our lives from a perspective of what the Lord says. Jesus declares in John 14, 12, I tell you the truth. Anyone who has faith in me will do what I've been doing. He will do even greater things than these because I'm going to the Father. The arm of the Lord will move through the church of Jesus Christ. We will believe His report. We will believe what He says, not what we say. Not what the world says. Not what the ten negative leaders are saying. But we will be like Joshua and Caleb and Moses and Aaron. We will humble ourselves before the Lord. We will tear our clothes. And we will continue to concretely search and stand upon God's word. And even when the negative report comes like what happened to Jehirus and it says your daughter is dead, we will not listen to them. And we will only believe. We will only believe. We will not allow fear to come in. And today, if you've allowed fear to dominate you, if you've stepped out of faith, if you find yourself in a situation where you are fearing constantly, where things are wrong in your life in every area, and you find that you have no peace, you have no joy, you have nothing, I want to ask you to repent, but not religiously, but relationally. I want to ask you to step into sonship. The Father is waiting for you to step into the position that you are supposed to step into. The Father has already given you the, the, the authority and the power. He's not thinking about your iniquity. He's not thinking about your sin. He's not considering what you've done. He's not holding that against you according to that scripture we read in Isaiah. He, all the sins were upon him. He was bruised for our iniquities. We don't have iniquity anymore. God is not sin conscious current, currently, but many people are. Many people are stuck in sin and they feel that they're not good enough to receive from the Lord. And I've come today to tell you that the price has been paid and He's already done it for you and for me. At this cross that you're seeing at my back here, He paid for everything. When Jesus said, it is done, the temple veil tore open and the Spirit of God moved out of the temple. And today He's living in living temples and the Spirit is working sanctification from the inside out. He's taken out the heart of stone and He's given us a heart of flesh. Maybe you've gone wrong. Maybe your theology is wrong. Maybe you need to enter into a Bible school and get a proper theology or, or proper training in theology. Maybe you don't even know what you believe. But let me tell you today, what I've seen in the past 29 years is the goodness of God. I have seen God cause victory against giants time and time again. And one thing that I've learned is that giants fall very hard in the face of God. Giants fall very hard because God is the God of the impossible. And you need to believe today the report of the arm of the Lord that He is the God of the impossible and He will make in your life all things possible in Jesus' name. I thank you for watching and I pray that the Holy Spirit will take you from glory to glory in Jesus' name.